and he is our uh, uh, guest and the person you all want to hear from. Uh, but I get to do a little intro about E2 Tech. You know what? Since this is a members event, uh, uh, we've been experiencing great growth, and I want to thank you for that. That 300 plus number is uh, pushing 325. Hopefully, member companies uh, see the benefits of the things that we do. Uh, talks like this, but also making connections across uh, industries and across sectors and supporting startups and existing companies when they want to innovate. Uh, one of the major things that we do is uh, these, our events are always free for students and public officials. Um, uh, Maine is a small state. I imagine, uh, like myself, I'm a Biddeford City Councilor. Many of you here are involved in municipal government. Uh, we make these things free. And your membership support uh, helps make that happen. Uh, pleased to be working on our initiatives in diversity, equity, and inclusion, primarily consisting of uh, helping people get jobs within our sector, almost kind of a concierge service that we provide. And uh, uh, we've been having good luck with that too. So uh, we're we're definitely a jobs hub, and and so if we can help someone you know land on their feet within our industry. And we like to do that. Um, much of that is connected to the Maine Technology Institute. I think Dr. Nacero is going to tell us about some innovation. Um, this is really the place to go. Uh, and remember, uh, you have an existing company, that's fine. You does, it, it doesn't have to be a startup as long as there's an innovation. Um, go to maintechnology.org and hit that ready to start button. I think sometimes you know, if, if you have a large company, you think, oh, MTI is not for me. That, that's, not, uh, that's not the case. There's lots of support uh, for you to add that new product line uh, or, or build that, uh, that new device. And these companies uh, make what we do possible all year long. Uh, please join me in thanking them uh, for supporting us throughout the year. The Sustaining Leader uh, provides, <laughs> to be blunt about it, $2,500 a year to E2 Tech. We're a small a nonprofit. Our overall budget is uh, um, under 200,000. We have a staff of sort of two and a half FTEs roughly. And um, so we, we do a lot with a little and these companies uh, make all that possible. And then these companies really team up as well. Uh, this is a thousand dollar level. So these are people that are stepping up basically saying, okay, we like what you're doing, keep doing it. Uh, let's do it throughout the year. So I would like to linger on this slide a little bit. Please work with these companies. If you need contacts at any of these companies, um, let Riley or I know. Um, uh, we can provide those connections. And all of our stuff all year long is sponsored by TRC and BHP. And would you like a uh, free print subscription to Maine Biz? Um, I know you do. And it actually it comes up promptly. It will show up in the mail. And it's free for E2 Tech members. We're going to send you a little form after this is still out, or we can do it for you if you like. And uh, read main bits. Uh, uh, this first note is not actually true. Your mic has not automatically been shut off. Uh, so just practice Zoom uh, uh, control there. And this is actually sort of intentional. We want to have an interactive discussion. Um, and and uh, sort of like we would have had in the hall at, at one of our uh, in-person events. And uh, we're blessed to have Dr. and Sarah here from Harvard, uh, which we can do because of the Zoom platform. And I encourage you to interact with him uh, directly after he uh, gives this presentation. And uh, I promised uh, Daniel that I would not linger on this, um, but uh, I encourage you to research uh, his work. It's remarkable. And I'm really pleased to have the chance to kind of bring something like this to our members here in Maine, um, which is a, it is, this is cutting edge research that uh, we're all going to benefit from. So uh, Daniel, uh, let's hear what um, uh, mind uh, expanding thoughts you have for us in our growing Maine uh, solar industry. Over to you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, <clears throat> so here, let me share my screen. And so I'll, I'll talk about today <clears throat> some discoveries we've made <clears throat> in the last few years. Um, before I do that, though, it, actually, there's a main connection to what I'll talk about today. Um, when you think about energy, it's important to have 
think about it in two flavors. And so the world you live in is one flavor. It turns out most of the world is in the other flavor, meaning you have a large energy infrastructure where energy demand is coming from is from places on in the planet that don't have large energy infrastructures. And so today I'll be talking more about what I call the non-legacy world, meaning people who haven't inherited an energy infrastructure. You're, you're stuck in some ways at some level because there are wires in the ground and there's this trillion, multi-trillion dollar infrastructure that's built around your energy path. The poor, however, in most of the world, they don't confront an established energy infrastructure. So they have a lot more flexibility. Um, and the big difference is that there's only 3 billion of you with a legacy, but there's 7 billion people to come in the next 25 years that will have a very low or non-legacy energy infrastructure. So that's what I mean when you do research, you have to have these two different targets. I'll, I'll just mention, because I'm not going to talk much about the legacy world, but I just wanted to bring this up with my main connection. Um, the way you therefore need to implement solar energy in a legacy environment where the infrastructure exists is you have to piggyback onto that infrastructure. So we all live off of a grid. It's a centralized grid. So it's what can you invent that would allow you to penetrate this established infrastructure with um, an invention. And so you, a lot of you know about solar panels, of course, you put solar panels on your roof, but when the sun isn't shining, of course, you need storage. And you might think of batteries in your house, but that is really expensive and most people don't want to maintain that. So this is my main connection. I started a company in 2009 with Bob Metcalf and Bob has I think he vacations in Maine and owns an island or something in top of Maine and all his friends come in. And uh, Bob actually gave the name to the company. Bob, <clears throat> Bob Metcalf invented Ethernet, not internet, but Ethernet. He invented the LAN protocol. And he helped me get this company started. And what we did is we made a little flow battery. So all that is, is you take Think of it, two cups of water and you put compounds in them and then you charge them up with electricity. So you could use the solar electricity to charge up the compound. Then when the sun goes down, you can recollect that charge by flowing the two compounds back over each other. So it's really like a battery. The batteries you think about in a car are solid state batteries. This is an aqueous based battery. And Actually, that company was purchased by Lockheed Martin. And I'm really proud of this because Lockheed Martin is the largest defense contractor in the world. And if you now look at their webpage, they also now say they're an energy storage company because of this invention. And 20 miles north of Boston and Andover, Mass, they're building these massive flow batteries. And so this would sit in your home this would sit in a power company. And as a matter of fact, they, their commercial launches this year, I think they're putting three to five large systems in at different power companies, also at military bases. And the way this would work is you have a solar panel on your house. So you generate electricity, you sell it back to the power company because you're not using it that much, all of it. And so you're happy, you're making money off of it. And actually the power company will even help you now put the solar panels on your roof if they own this because you will be an energy generator for them. Then at night, the sun goes down. During the day, they're taking your electricity and charging up these compounds in these huge tanks that sit on the floor of the power company. And then at night, they send the electricity back to you and they can recollect their ROI, the free panel you think you got, they can prorate over 20 years, for instance. 
and they sell it back at a higher price so they can get a return on their investment for buying this battery. And so this is an example of the legacy world where we relied on the grid, we made this flow battery. And by the way, I, when I sold it, I only had made a five kilowatt system. They're now selling a 10 or 50 megawatt system. So that, that, that's a huge flow battery. I mean, the dimensions on this are what I'm showing you here. And uh, it's a way that you make energy a commodity for a power company. And it's a way to penetrate with renewables into this established infrastructure. So we've done work like this for what I'll call the legacy world, but this is an example. This is a huge success and uh, you can read about it on the web if you want. But what I really want to talk to you today is about the 7 billion people who don't have energy in the next 20, 35 years. And so there you don't have that energy infrastructure. And I, use this word called the sustainacine. And what that means is when you think about sustainability, you probably think about the top left right picture, which is blue earth and greenness. And that's what most people think about sustainability. But with the sustainacine, what I mean by that term is it's impossible to have the top right if you have the bottom left. And that's poverty and energy poverty. So if you have lots of poor people without energy, you can't have the top right, a sustainable planet. So that's a concept, the sustainacine. Um, actually, I spent most of my career at MIT. And so this is a Harvard thing. You name things like sociologically sustainacine. But at MIT, you put equations behind everything. So here's the equation that supports the sustainability. And it's actually an identity relationship. And what it says is, so the thing on the left is equal to the thing on the right. I just took energy and I broke it into three components. So one is population and that's N. So the number of people on the planet or in a country, let's do a country. And then GDP per capita, so you, whether you realize it or not, money, energy is actually money. If you have energy, you have money. If you don't have energy, you don't have wealth in, in our society. And so it turns out that you can see relations where GDP scales linearly with energy used. And so GDP is a measure for amount of energy used. And so that's GDP per capita. So I can go on Google, I can look up the population of a country, and then I can look up their GDP per capita. And then energy intensity, the last value there, that is, whether you realize it or not, it's a quantitative measure of conservation. And so what that's saying is a country hits a GDP in 2022. Next year, if they use less energy to hit that GDP, they can serve. If they use more energy to hit that GDP, they didn't conserve. And by the amount, let's say they conserve, by the amount of energy, less energy that they use to hit the same GDP, that's the amount of conservation. And so when you multiply all these terms together, the population drops out, GDP drops out, energy equals energy. But this is an instructive equation because it tells you you need to worry about population because population is a huge driver and then GDP per capita. So many years ago, I did that and I did the calculation for the global planet. And what you found, what you find out is that the world today uses 18 terawatt equivalents of energy. So I'm showing a light bulb because a watt is power. It's energy per unit time. <clears throat> I like using that because you don't need to ask me then, am I talking about a day or a year or a decade? The way you can think about this is the world is 
burning or having keeping on an 18 terawatt light bulb. And so it's an 18 trillion watt light bulb and it's always on and you need to give it energy to keep that 18 trillion watt light bulb on. And it turns out 81.2% of the energy globally that you give that light bulb comes from coal, oil, and gas. And so that is today. Now, if I go forward to say 2050, population growth is going, we're gonna hit a population of 10.2 billion. And now I do the calculation and what I need to do then, the only estimate I need to make is one on GDP per capita. And what I do there is I assume a 2.3% global growth in GDP. That's been happening for the last hundred years, basically. And so with that approximation that the global average will be 2.3% in terms of economic growth, when I add in these 7 billion people, and you have to realize, as I'm speaking to you now, around 3.5 billion people have no energy or very little energy. As a matter of fact, 1.4 billion have never seen an electron in a wire, believe it or not, even today. And it turns out the 3 billion people that will be born in the future are being born in the energy-deprived part of the world. So now when I do that calculation, I find out in the next 30 years, you're going to need 16 terawatt equivalents more of energy, or you'll be burning a 34 trillion watt light bulb. And that's formidable. Uh, I can do, we can do numbers, but for instance, if you build, and we can talk about this later, say you wanted to do nuclear, you might not like nuclear, but at least nuclear is CO2 um, neutral. It's not going to add a lot of carbon dioxide after you build the plant. Um, but you should realize if you want 10 terawatts, you need to build 200 nuclear power plants per year for the next 40 years to get 10 terawatts. And then after you're done, a nuclear power plant's only rated for 50 years. So you can take a 10 year break and then you gotta start rebuilding all the ones you built today. So that means if you think about it, to get 10 terawatts out of nuclear and you need 16, you're going to need to build over 200 power plants a year for 40 years, take a 10 year break and then start rebuilding. And that gives you a feeling for the scale of the problem. And we can talk later about all other potential carbon neutral power sources. Uh, it just highlights how much energy you're going to need as the poor come online. And then to get back to this idea of the sustainacy, if the poor adopt our carbon-based infrastructure, if you think you have big problems now keeping that picture green and blue, when you have 7 billion people using your current infrastructure and type of energy, uh, 7 billion more people, you're going to have real problems. You haven't even seen the beginning of problems that we're already experiencing worldwide. So that's the idea behind the sustainability is the poor need energy, but they need a different flavor of energy and a renewable flavor. So that's what this slide is saying that by 2050, the push for energy is going to be the poor. It needs, if you want to have a sustainable planet, you're going to need to give them renewable energy. And that means it should be not complicated. And I also wrote lightweight and highly manufacturable. So why did I do that? And this is an interesting plot. Um, again, um, everything I do is on Google. My students actually do research, but I just sit in my office and do Google plots. So here's a Google plot. You could all make it. And what I did is I just said, how much is a Boeing 777 weigh? And then I said, what is its cost? And I normalized cost for weight. And I get a curve. And that's interesting because now I put annual production of something relative to manufacturing costs. And 
This is for things that you make a lot, like energy systems. So what won't this work for? It won't work for IT. So IT is a low CapEx endeavor. You put a kid in Harvard Yard and he comes up with a social platform and destroys our global society with it. You know, he only needed a thousand dollars to start Facebook, for instance. So that's a low CapEx venture. So that doesn't work for this. The other thing that doesn't work for this is pharma or drugs. Because whether you realize it or not, when you're investing in drugs or pharma, you're not investing that much actually for the cost or development or manufacturing of the drug. What you're really investing in is hope because we'll pay anything to live forever. So energy, you don't look for hope. No, I haven't seen anybody plugging, a, putting a plug in the wall and saying, I hope energy comes out of it. And it's certainly not low CapEx, like I explained to you already. But for manufacturable things, this curve holds. And the only reason why Boeing 777 is up here is it has a lot more IT in it than your automobile. But what the interesting thing here is when you finally look where this curve levels out, you never can make anything for less than $10 per pound. And I don't care what it is, and if you don't believe me, this is true. I'm not kidding you. I literally called McDonald's, who has a CTO, and the weight of their quarter pounder, if I take the weight of the tomato, lettuce, bun, and patty, it comes out to around $10 per pound. So can you believe that? And that's practically no different than an automobile. It's just heavier. So once I normalize production weight, at the lowest possible value of $10 per pound, it turns out everything scales. Now, why is that important for energy? Because what we do in this part of the world, the legacy world, is we build one big heavy thing, the power plant, plus the heavy part of the grid. So now you've built that, it's heavy, and you multiply $10 per pound, and that power plant comes out to $2 billion. Then what you do, is you say, I have the power plant, I invested $2 billion, but I own the energy, so now I'll sell it to you and return my investment over some period of time. So that's how all energy works in the legacy world. Somebody does a large centralized investment, and then they own energy, you buy it, they recover their return on investment, whether it's an oil company, electrical company, you name it. The other way to think about this is a reverse thinking. And now I'm going to do the reverse thinking using McDonald's, say, as my example. So if McDonald's had a business model that was like an energy system in the legacy world, did you ever think what it might look like? It would be they would make one huge hamburger. And then you would all drive to it, take a bite out of it, and then drive home. So that would be a centralized model for McDonald's. But that's not how McDonald's works. McDonald's does a distributed model of hamburgers. And so the centralized infrastructure idea doesn't work anytime soon for the poor. And the reason is you have to build this massive infrastructure and nobody wants to invest in the poorer parts of the world at a large scale because there's not enough money for a quick ROI. And so we started thinking, could we do the McDonald's business model of energy? Could I make a little hamburger patty of energy? And so what we thought is, it can't be complicated in engineering. And then a second requirement we put on our research was it needs to have available resources. So that told us to use the sun. So there's a lot of reasons people like solar. We like solar because anybody can look up and see the sun. And then there's air around everybody. And there's water. Now you're going to argue, no, water is a valuable commodity. And that's true, drinking water. 
but we're using even wastewater, including urine, so any water source. So we said, could we just use sunlight, air, and any water and give energy, food, stored energy to the poor? So that's what we set out to do. And that sounds futuristic, but it shouldn't because you walk by millions of them every day and you don't pay attention to them. And they, they're basically speaking to you saying, use me and be like me. And that's a leaf. Because what a leaf does is it uses air. It sucks in carbon dioxide from air. It catches sunlight. And then you put water on the plant and it takes carbon dioxide plus water and rearranges the bonds of carbon dioxide and water to make biomass or sugars or food or carbohydrate and oxygen. And so while that sounds futuristic, and my title said making fuel and food from thin air, it turns out it's happening at massive scale around you every second as I'm speaking right now. So we just wanted to be like a leaf. It was that simple. Um, that's a tough job though. So here's a scientist that said, it's a tough job trying to be like a leaf photosynthesis. And if our civilization based on coal and oil were followed by a quieter one based on solar energy, that would be nice for human happiness. And it's said to fix solar energy through the reactions and processes that have been the guarded secret of plants. So if you read this, you would think, yeah, that's 2020, that's what we should be doing. He said that in 1912. That's the first solar photochemist named Chimmy John. He was an Italian photochemist in Bologna. If you go to the University of Bologna, you'll see the Chimmy John Institute. So this has been thought about for over a hundred years at a scientific level, and nobody was able to do this. So we set out to be like a plant, like Chimmy Chan told us to do, but you have to think about a plant and how it really operates. So whether you realize it or not, the, it's a two-step process. One is using sunlight. So when you give water to a plant, the plant sucks the water up into the leaf and then it catches the photons. And what it does is it takes water and rearranges the bonds of water to make oxygen and hydrogen. And that's an energetically uphill reaction, meaning you need to put energy in. You're, you're, you're running an energy up a, 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 a hill event effectively. Once you're at the top of the hill, to take hydrogen and combine it with carbon dioxide, you can do that in the dark. So the plant only needs sunlight to rearrange the bonds of water to oxygen and hydrogen. Then at night, it can breathe in the CO2 and then combine it with hydrogen and make food and biomass, what you think about as photosynthesis. So we said we needed to do both steps, a light reaction and then the dark reaction. And so here's what I just told you on the bottom. I'm only showing this because it took around half an hour of PowerPoint to have all these things go this way. So there's water and sunlight comes in. And now I rearrange water, the OH bonds in water to hydrogen and oxygen. That's what your plants do. And hydrogen and oxygen are very powerful fuels. And by the way, if you decided to use fuel cells everywhere, case over, you could just use a fuel cell. You need to store hydrogen though. And that's a hard thing to do. That's why you haven't seen big penetration yet of fuel cells in society. So once you have that hydrogen, you can then combine it with carbon dioxide and make biomass. So I'm not gonna go into all of our discoveries, but we made two different compounds. So the top compound, that those are elements, cobalt and oxygen and phosphate. All you need to know is when they get charged up with electricity, the top compound, this funny cobalt compound with the COs, when it gets charged up with electricity, it, it gives you half of the water splitting reaction. It gives you oxygen. The part that's left over is then taken by another catalyst. These are called catalysts. 
and they combine the leftover electrons and protons and make hydrogen. So when these two compounds get charged up with electricity, if I were to plug them into the wall and use the electrical current from the wall, and I put them on two what are called electrodes, on one electrode, you would see oxygen bubbling off, and on the other electrode, you would see hydrogen. The problem is, I didn't say there was sunlight involved in this. And so what we did is we thought about your solar panel that you have on your roof. And what happens in a solar panel, when the sun hits it, it makes a positive and negative charge, an electron and a hole, the positive and negative. And then your solar panel, you have a barrier in between. So because the electron and hole are really energetic, the sun just made at them. And so they just want to get back together. But in your solar panel, you have this buffer layer so that they can't get together and they can only recombine in an external circuit. You put a load on it like a light bulb when your light bulb lights up. So what we said is we don't need all the parts of a solar panel. We only need the heart of it, the silicon that makes the positive and negative charge. And so we did that. We took silicon. We made a special type of silicon. And when the sun hit it, you actually made the positive charge and negative charge go up and down. So if I had a playing card of the silicon and sun hit it, the top of the playing card would get positively charged and the bottom would get negatively charged, just like in a solar panel. And then we just coated it with our two catalysts I just showed you. And off the top of the catalyst, the positive part that you can see oxygen. So here, I'm gonna show it really works. This is just sitting in my window here in my office and the positive charge is making the oxygen that's gone to the front part of the silicon. The negative charge goes to the back part of the, the silicon panel, and that makes hydrogen. I think it will turn around, and there's the hydrogen. Now, that's a dumb engineered device because I'm letting the oxygen and hydrogen recombine. You just have to put a separator in, and you can take the hydrogen and oxygen off. So that is a way I can store energy like the leaf. That's why we call this the artificial leaf. It's the solar part of a leaf. And it's like a hamburger. I could just pass these out to people. And you can think about the silicon as the hamburger patty. I have to protect the silicon. Oxygen plus silicon makes sand, SiO2. So I do that with a piece of cheese. This is called a buffer layer. And then on the top bun is my cobalt catalyst, the oxygen catalyst, and the bottom bun is the hydrogen catalyst. So you literally can just walk around with these, drop it even in urine, and you'll see oxygen and hydrogen come up. So it's the hamburger patty of energy. Okay. The problem with that, as I already told you, is you don't have a big infrastructure for a fuel cell. So what we then said is we had to make a reaction work in the dark. And so what we did is we said this dark reaction, we called it the bionic leaf, will still do what I just told you and use sunlight to make oxygen and hydrogen. But then I'll take a bacterium and I'll make the bacterium. I can use genetics and tell the bacteria, your only food source is gonna be the energetic hydrogen from the sun. If you don't have hydrogen, you die. So it's eating the hydrogen as a fuel. I then tell it to breathe in carbon dioxide and then grow. And so I can grow biomass this way, just like a plant or a leaf is growing on a tree. I have organisms that are mostly all carbon and hydrogen. It's the cellular wall of bacteria. And I just grow them in a vat. The other thing I can do is say, use more genetics and tell the bacteria not to grow, but to combine the carbon and hydrogen and make fuels. And basically what I'm doing, this is the photosynthetic membrane, it's complicated, but I can offload most of the photosynthetic membrane with just solar water splitting from the artificial leaf. And then in the dark, because I now have the energetic hydrogen, I can say breathe in the hydrogen, 
then use biological machinery and combine hydrogen with carbon dioxide and make fuel. So here's the end result. I can grow biomass at 11%. So that's energy of sun in to energy stored in biomass. And you have to realize the best growing crops can only store 1% because most of the energy is used to live in a plant, not to be stored. So we can, doing this artificial photosynthesis, we can beat out nature by 10 to 100 times. And these dark bars, the dark blue and dark red bar are actually fuels, liquid fuel. So instead of growing, which is the green bar, I can tell the bacteria combine carbon dioxide and hydrogen from water splitting and make a fuel. And I'm doing that at 6%. This is isopentanol, C5. Gasoline is C8. So this is a high energy fuel I make. In your cars, you put ethanol sometimes. That's only C2. So this has five more carbons. So this is a way now you can do, if you have the artificial leaf and these bugs, you can literally make liquid fuel in a distributed way using just sunlight, air, and water. So that was one of our goals. And we're doing it better than nature by a factor of 10. For something like corn, you see this all the time, corn ethanol, we're actually, 580 times more efficient than growing corn. So if you're ever gonna do corn ethanol, this is 580 times better this way. The other thing in air that you need that's energy intensive is nitrogen because N2 combined with hydrogen makes ammonia and that's fertilizer. So what we did there is a three-step process. It's a little more complicated. This purple bar, we tell the organism, breathe hydrogen, carbon dioxide, and then store like a hibernating bear, get, get fat on energy. Then I've now stored sunlight in the hibernating bear and the hibernating bacteria. It doesn't need sunlight anymore. I only needed sunlight to do the light reaction of water splitting to make oxygen and hydrogen, store it. And then once you're, I'm gonna put you in the ground and draw on the stored energy and hydrogen in these white dots, you can think of it like fat globules, draw on that and then combine the hydrogen with nitrogen and make ammonia. And again, that's a dark reaction. So it's a three-step process. I have a vat with solar panels and I grow the bacteria. They breathe in CO2 and they store it. Those are those green dots. Then I put them in the ground and I say, breathe in nitrogen from the air. Take the hydrogen and energy that you've stored from the sun and combine it and make ammonia. And I should be able to grow plants. So I should be able to take even sandy soils, put the bacteria in the ground, and then the bacteria re the soil with nitrogen from the air, carbon from the air, because as it, eats, as it eats the stored energy supply, it leaves carbon in the air. And then I didn't tell you this, but if you put the bacteria near wastewater in, in urine through a wastewater treatment plant, that's a lot of phosphorus. I can store phosphorus. So I can put carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus back in the ground, and I should be able to grow crops. And so on the middle panel, these are farm trials I've done in the US. I'm running like 20 huge farm trials. This is a 400 acre farm in this middle panel. They use 130 pounds of nitrogen per acre to grow the lettuce and to grow the corn in this 400 acre farm. In the final panel, I replace 90% of the chemical fertilizer with the bug, which is making fertilizer on the fly organically and sustainably. So I've replaced 90% of the fertilizer. Now, that means I've saved 
in this farm, it's 130 pounds per nitrogen per acre from chemical fertilizer. That means I've saved 117 pounds of nitrogen per acre using chemical fertilizer. And that's significant because another huge carbon source that you're dumping into the air comes from fertilizer. Because the way you make fertilizer, like Haber Bosch, so this is a BASF plant. The, this is a nitrogen plant, believe it or not. And it's taking methane, the hydrogen from methane to make ammonia, this NH3. And then you can see it makes a lot of carbon dioxide. So this is real data for the farm I just showed you. The, the, this is measured data. That farm, because of Harbor Bosch, produces 225,000 pounds of carbon dioxide, which I've eliminated. And then I've also pulled CO2 from the air, like I told you, and when the bug finishes eating its fat supply, solar fat supply, it leaves the carbon in the ground. I've sucked 29,000 pounds of carbon dioxide out of the air. So in that one farm trial I just showed you, which is one 400 acre farm, I saved 250,000 pounds of carbon dioxide or 154 metric tons of carbon dioxide from going into the air on that one little farm using this biofertilizer. So that's significant carbon uh, farming. Um, you can imagine this is already getting commercialized. In California, they are going to be required in the next few years to reduce 50% of their chemical fertilizer with something else. And there is nothing else. Well, this is, this is something else for them. So you can imagine a lot of my farm trials right now are in the Salinas Valley. So that's all I wanted to tell you about. Just using sunlight, air, and water, any water, you can do distributed fuel and food production. I should tell you, I'm about to publish a paper where I take air, nitrogen and carbon from the air, sunlight and water, and we actually make vitamin B2, a complicated molecule. I can make vitamins directly from thin air. So I think this is a general way of combining solar water splitting, which is inorganic chemistry, with biology to do chemical manufacturing in a broader sense. But our initial targets have been food and energy. And this is especially important for poor parts of the world. Now, just to end the talk, I kind of told you what you're up against in the next 30 years with energy. And I used to give a talk and, and before he died, I used to give a lot of public talks and he was there at a few. And Kurt Vonnegut said to me, Dan, you're always saying, save the planet. You need to save the planet, save the planet. And then this is how he thought. And he thinks very, as you well know, if you know Kurt Vonnegut in a very unique way, he said, the planet is a living organism. And like any living organism, they, she has an immunological response. And when an organism is being invaded by an irksome intruder, when sufficiently compromised, the immunological response will kick in and eliminate the irksome intruder. So he said, as we carelessly choose a path to suffocate the planet in CO2, we not, need not worry, the planet's immune system will respond and eliminate us from the planet and she's gonna be just fine. So I just want you to give that happy note as we continue to make really dumb choices the planet is going to be spectacularly healthy and happy. You just won't exist on it. And for some odd reason, that makes me feel comforted. Um, and then to end this, I just want to thank, believe it or not, I never got funding from the Department of Energy to do this because the US Department of Energy isn't really worried about poor people in other parts of the world. So all this work was done because of Cap Taylor and Tom Steyer. They gave me a nice gift at Harvard that enabled all this discovery. So I'm very appreciative to them. So that's it, um, Martin. And now I'll take any questions you guys might have. That's remarkable, Daniel. Thank you. And uh, uh, thanks to Cap Taylor and Tom Steyer for funding the work. I am uh, fairly involved with the U.S. Green Building Council over the years. And I know Tom has, uh, has done a lot of funding there. So that's a 
a really amazing connection that I wasn't aware of. Um, so I'm hoping that members of the audience will uh, pop up. And one of the ways that I like to do that is my trademark uh, smiling street shot. So if you don't mind turning your uh, camera on for a second and give me a little smile, I will uh, I will grab that screenshot. And it's a way to uh, nothing like a smile to get you thinking and uh, engaged. And that's the whole idea here. So uh, okay, great. Uh, on three, one, two, three. All right, I got gotcha. you. So who's got a question? I'm I'm ready with a couple, but I'm not the best person uh, to ask. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, Jared. So um, Daniel, it was a great presentation, um, and, and I was trying to follow the chemistry as you described it. What type of infrastructure would be needed locally? Um, in order to scale it up so that the, the amount of materials generated would be able to, um, you know, benefit uh, users. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So for the artificial leaf for storing solar energy, the first part to do the water splitting, um, you, the average American uses around a thousand kilowatt hours per person. So one tenth the energy supply I could, so if you look at a door in your house, a, a leaf that big could give them one tenth the energy supply for a US home user. Um, what I would just need is the silicon panel then, and then my compounds. And the problem though with hydrogen is you need to store it. So I did this with Mr. Tata, Ratan Tata, and we ran into the hydrogen storage problem. And so, by the way, that's when I pivoted and I made the flow battery. So I did that with Mr. Tato. But what's nice now is Lockheed Martin's making one where it would be the size for a little village and it could be put on a micro grid. And they didn't target that, but for, for power, for, for army bases, that little or little outfits out in the field, that would be good for them. So that kind of makes me happy. But my original idea was I'll just make fuel for the poor. To get to the fuel, liquid fuel part, in addition to the one door solar panel, you would need a vat where I could, and then my compounds where you would grow the, grow the, the bugs that would be making either the fertilizer or the fuel. Um, I will tell you for the US, what I'm doing now in Salinas Valley is I'm going to make a 1,000 liter reactor and that would service like a, a huge area in the salinas valley and i wouldn't have to do distribution of fuel so i'm going to build a one um you, on a hundred a hundred liter reactor i could service a village in india easily on a thousand liter reactor i could do parts of this world the legacy world and follow up is it a closed system or does it yeah. or does it require inputs of the the only input is water okay and then it's pulling carbon dioxide nitrogen from the air as inputs so that's it it really literally is sunlight air and water that's it that's remarkable i'm going to ask a sort of broader question and maybe i go to somebody else maybe uh, eleanor suzanne uh, or uh, carla uh, or whoever would like to but Two part, Dale, what question are you sick of answering and what question should people be asking? Okay, so the one I'm sick of answering is, when will it go to market? Not the nitrogen, I'm gonna talk about that in a minute, but the fuel part. And the reason I'm sick of answering that is because the question is, everybody should ask themselves, do they want it? And the reason is, like I told you, you have a massive infrastructure here where you put a straw in the ground and you suck oil out of it. And so until you price carbon, you'll never make something that's cost competitive with a hundred trillion dollar paid off infrastructure. And that's for fuel. And Everybody wants it, but then nobody wants to pay for it. You know, it's the typical energy problem <laughs> with mm -hmm. our society. But I will tell you, the fertilizer, believe it or not, that this 
we're already commercially cost competitive with chemical fertilizer. And so there is a company that started in, I went north with Lockheed Martin to just spread it out. I went south to Natick and there's a company called Kula Bio. And by the end of this year, we will be providing the fertilizer commercially. So the bionic leaf N, which I call ammonia food fertilizer food production, that's already going commercial in under three or four years. But actually, I started the company in 2019, three years, and it's needed no incentives. But for fuel, you'll need to price carbon. Hmm. That's true of any technology. And don't believe anybody's ever going to invent a solar fuel technology that will be, uh, compete with oil or gas because you've paid this massive paid off infrastructure. Now, the flow battery is cost competitive and it's already being commercialized by Lockheed Martin. So that did work. But to, to have a to just be able to make your own fuel on site and then dump it in your car, it, you're going to need um, the price differentials around a factor of three to four right now. Gotcha. Interesting. Uh, Ed, mash that mute button for us, Ed. The water that's needed doesn't have to be clean, or does it? The urine I've used. So I, did, I didn't get you the details, but those two compounds that split hydrogen and oxygen, we had it and do a lot of science invention. And we, we made them self-healing. So as they're breaking down, they fix themselves. They use a little bit of the solar energy to heal themselves. And we made this thing called self-healing catalyst, which was done for the first time. That allows us to use even like we've used the Charles River, a puddle on the ground or urine, and it will work. And as the compounds break down, they we put pathways in for them to rebuild themselves. And we call it self-healing. And that, you know, I, I have 40 papers in the literature to explain to the science community how to build a self-healing catalyst. That, that took us a lot of time, actually. Yeah, it sounds like it would be very meaningful in the world of plastics, which is uh, my background. But um, uh, other questions? Yeah, by the way, for, Ed, for Ed's question, and I heard somebody's here from the Air Force, I got a lot of Air Force money and Navy money. You can imagine the Navy's now interested in this. They don't care about hydrogen, but they care about oxygen on the fly, and my compounds work out of seawater. So you can kind of think of like this movie, Aquaman, but the Navy is funding me to do O2 generation on the fly. Now, the diver has to bring battery down with them, but the batteries are high energy density batteries that we're making today, even way more than going to Tesla, you have way more energy. So a little battery pack, they can now generate oxygen on the fly. So I'm actually doing that for the Navy, breathable oxygen. <laughs> so there's lots of spin-offs for making self-healing catalysts actually. That's really neat, Daniel, and uh, you've got a proven track record too. So uh, I will ask the second part of my question: what 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 questions should people be asking you? Um, when they when they say they care about renewable energy, they need to ask themselves how much do they really care about renewable energy? Because <laughs> I'm afraid we don't really care that much. I have to say, and you see, you see the idiocy of politics and by the way i'm i'm generically neutral on politicians i hate them all because they're all scam artists so whether they're republican or democrat they're all in my book uh out to lunch and um they and i think it's our society energy is a weird thing it's like i love renewable energy as long as it doesn't affect my life of course it's going to cost more but nobody wants to pay for it right people don't even realize the gas prices it's due to the ukraine war so yeah we're really against russia invading the ukraine war oh but by the way we want we're really angry that gas prices have gone up. i mean they just don't get it and so um 
Yeah, the question people structure. need to ask is, and, and then they need to vote it, but they just don't. Um, so that's why I don't complain about that. I, what I try to do is just invent stuff. I mean, the challenge for me in any scientist is to say, can I do things with minimal incentives? And so I'm really proud of the flow battery. And I needed Lockheed Martin's help. I sold that company early. I didn't hang on to it like most people would to try to overvalue the company. Very early on, I sold it to Lockheed because I needed them to go to market. I needed that might. And they didn't need any incentives. They're now like power companies are coming to them saying, please build this. You're making energy a commodity for us. And, and the bionic leaf and the fertilizer one, I need no incentives. But the fuel one, I'll actually need a carbon incentive, unfortunately. I don't see any way around it. Well, that's remarkable. Daniel was so appreciative. And I, I have to sort of laugh because it's like you've been uh, attending meetings of the E2Tech Program Committee, where we're uh, looking at a program uh, where we'll explore sort of citing challenges and trade-offs in that great big puzzle, which is our uh, energy markets. And so you've given us a ton to uh, think about. Um, uh, we will share your slides if you're comfortable sharing them. We'll also be sharing the recording. And uh, uh, Daniel, in a second, I'm going to go to you for a, a closing statement. But I would like everybody to join uh, Riley and I and Bryant and other members of the E2 Tech staff at this event coming up uh, two weeks from tomorrow. Uh, no program, no talking, uh, just meeting and networking with your friends and colleagues. And then we have, uh, and uh, Daniel might want to come on, on this, but we are, we'll be doing a program on forest carbon credits and how they work uh, tentatively uh, September 13th. So stay tuned for uh, that one. So uh, uh, a closing thought uh, to leave us with Daniel, maybe, you know, this reach in, in the, uh, the low income world where what we take for granted um, isn't available or anything like that you want us to to head out with yeah. into our day. I mean, you, really, for a sustainable earth, it's kind of weird to say, but you really need to worry about the poor now. It's that simple. Um, but here, here's something you can take home tonight. Every time you walk by a tree, look at those leaves and know how much greater they are than you and how much you depend on them. People yeah. just don't realize it. But they're, they're all my friends. People actually find my personality acerbic and they run away from me. But I have millions of friends outside my window. Um, they're really amazing. And so they're trying to talk to you. And I always say when the sun is shining on you, I've never seen when it's sunny, somebody looking up going like this. And when you feel her warming you, she's literally talking to you. So you should think like that. And it will... It makes it more personal, and that's how I think when I walk around outside. So you should think about think about it as a very personal thing, renewable energy. I love it, Daniel. We don't find you a cervic at all. Uh, we are welcome here uh, in Maine at any time in the e Tech program. Uh, Riley, would you give us a wave? Riley Ewald, our program policy administrator, makes these things happen. Brian Wolf interning uh, for us over the summer with the Bride Family Fellowship at 2L Admin Law. Uh, thank you all for being members of E2Tech. I hope to see you uh, on the 17th uh, for Geary's Brewing Company uh, event for a Force Carbon Credit. Keep uh, your ideas coming. And Daniel, thank you so much. You, you have no idea how much you've expanded our take, our thoughts, our, the way we're approaching things here in Maine. Thank you for that. What a wonderful presentation. Uh, yes, a round of applause, and we wish you a... Uh, wonderful afternoon and uh, i will be paying attention to the leaves and uh i guess where i am also the uh, pine needle <laughs> yeah sure okay bye-bye everybody take care all thank you bye